was going to do it on the trade in the <coughs> Indians and the English. The natives and the English? Uh, what time period? The very beginning. Okay. Okay. All right. So maybe not just British, but also the French. Okay. All right, Aiden. I was thinking um, on the Civil War more specifically, uh, some of the key issues that caused the war, and some of the uh, strengths and weaknesses of each side, right. and how that contributed to the outcome. Causes and strengths and weaknesses. Okay. Nice. Okay, Ivy. Oh, I got something. Is your name <laughs> Ivy? <laughs> How about you, Ivy? Um, I can't ask the platform right now. Okay. So I don't know. If you turn your Wi-Fi on. I think it's the Wi-Fi on. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, what are you asking? What paper topic? Uh, Civil War. Civil War? Okay. Pretty broad topic. Yeah. Lots of dissertations um, on that. Yeah, I haven't really had a chance to go in depth. Okay. Review of it. Okay. Um, Garrett. Uh, Conquest wars, conquering the fiasco. Oh, that'll be a nice one. Good. Okay. How about you, Savannah? Native American involvement in the revolution. Okay. So Native American involvement in Revolutionary War, Native American involvement in trade. And Brianna, how about you? Um, not exactly trade, I just think about all my fucking friends. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, Morgan and Taylor. Uh we're we're discussing paper topics. Sure, but uh, it's a, that's a dissertation topic, so how would you like to narrow it down a little bit? Can I tell you by the end of class? You can tell me by tonight. And your topics can also, uh, sometimes your topics will change. One, sometimes you can't find enough information on the exact topic that you, you want, um, but also... Uh, you know, sometimes you'll find something that you're much more interested in. Like you'll find a certain aspect of slavery that you're more interested in than, than another. All right, how about you, Morgan? We have until tonight to tell you, right? <laughs> yes, I yes. Think yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. I'll, I'll let you know tonight. Okay. All right, is Star here? Okay, not today. Yep, I'm here. Oh, you are. And your paper topic, Star? I'm still trying to narrow it down, but I wanted to do something to do with the Native American. Um, so I'm either, uh, when I was researching last night, I was thinking of maybe doing um, some of the territorial wars and carrying them on maybe tactics or something. Not really sure. It's all things. Can I narrow, but something I can actually write a research paper on. Fantastic. Okay. Good. Maybe something Native American based. Yeah. Excellent. Um, is Amber here today? Okay. All right. So the quote for today: "The liberty of speaking and writing guards our other liberties." Does it truly? What do you think, Valdez? Does the liberty of speaking and writing guard our other liber liberties? Um, if you're not illiterate, you'll be able to use your other liberties. Okay. Meaning what? Well, back then, illiteracy was stupidity, and if stupid you wouldn't know your rights okay um 
That's a pretty strong word. The, um, so, but yes, being able to read and write was integral to the, especially the Puritans, right? And if you do not know your rights or not, you're not able to read and write, a lot of times you would, um, other people would take advantage of you. And you'll see that as we go further into the, into the chapters in regards to um, former slaves signing documents that uh, ended up being debt payments and they had no idea what they were signing because one, it wasn't explained to them and two, they didn't know how to read and write so they had no idea what it said. Okay? Um, it also happened with Native Americans. It happens even today. Uh, people sign things that they don't read. Right? But no one in this room or no one in these in this class has ever signed anything without reading it fully, correct? <laughs> right. Okay. Right. This is this is my debt collector coming out. Yeah. That online signature stuff is part of you just say you don't get it in your hand. Right. Right. And Savannah said that if it take if you read everything it would take what? Yes. However, what do you sign? Okay. I I was a debt collector, so I did uh, I did things like repo things. I went into people's houses and repossessed furniture and and all this stuff. And one reason that I did that is because people did not read, and they didn't understand what would happen if they didn't read it. So <laughs> it makes my left eye twitch and my right ear twitch when I hear people say that they don't read what they sign. Okay, just letting you know. Amber, do you have a paper topic? <laughs> the, uh, the research paper that we're doing, we went around the room and uh, most had uh, a paper topic, but if you don't have one, it's due to see. Anything? It can be anything up to uh, from the beginning of history that we studied to 1877. Boston Massacre. Boston Massacre. Great topic. Love that. Okay. So I'm really excited about the uh, about the papers. I think they're going to be great. All righty. So, we are here on chapter three. Yes? Okay. All right, we're talking about the colonial societies in 1700. 250,000 people of European birth or parentage were in the U.S. and Canada in 1700. Okay. How many people live in Anchorage? About 260, 275. So, more people live in Anchorage today than lived in the colonial societies in 1700. All right? So, think about those numbers. 30,000 of them were enslaved Africans. The Native American population continues to decline. Right? Okay, so you have um, Native Americans who are uh, hit with smallpox epidemic and warfare and influenza and tuberculosis and these other epidemics uh, and so their population continues to decline as well as being moved okay uh, and the ecosystems the ecosystems change as well which also creates a decline in the Native American population. And the colonies 
were built on Native American sites for the most part, right? Plymouth Rock, Wampanoag, a burned village, okay? The quintessential um, colony being built on a Native site. All right, remember when the, when the uh, traders first came to North America, they were astounded because there was nowhere along the coast that could support a colony because all of the great uh, sites were already taken. People already lived there. All right? So England dominated the colonial societies in 1700. The Dutch um, were moved out of North America, and France and Spain had these unattractive colony lands, right? Okay? Spain had lands where? Florida, where else? South America. Uh huh. Where else? Robin, do you know? No, I was <laughs> I was in the other room for a second. Sorry. Okay. That's all right. I was asking where Spain had other lands. Um, New Mexico. Remember the Pueblo Revolt? The greatest or most successful Native American revolt in North America was in New Mexico. The Pueblo Revolt. Okay. So, one of the other reasons that England dominated is because they had this mass migration into the colonies. So this slide here demonstrates that mass migration. Okay? So uh, 110,000 English citizens um, and indentured servants went to the West Indies. Right? 25,000 went to New England, but 50,000 went to the Chesapeake. So 189,000 people, we only had 250,000 people by 1700. Why is that? Wars. Wars. Uh, yes. Not necessarily a lot of ep epidemics, but indentured servants were working in the fields and they caught malaria. Um, they had yellow fever. And the work was extremely hard, okay? And a lot of them died from just overwork. Uh, but also in the colonies, uh, you had the 30,000 Africans by 1700, and then it talks about um, less people up to, to the North American colonies. Um, in the Chesapeake, most of them were tobacco workers, and 90% of them were indentured servants. So how many years did indentured servants work in general? Two to four, generally. Six, two, four, six, you know, in there. It ranged. There were different ranges um, for the indentured service. But it was... Uh, if you want to say an average, probably four. Okay. So the Chesapeake Society in Virginia, King James the first created a royal colony in Virginia. And royal colonies are important for several different reasons. Um, one of the reasons would be power, right? And in this case, a royal colony would be under whose power? The king's power. Yes, the royal, royal power. Okay? So he killed the uh, elected assembly in Virginia when he created a royal colony. Right? And we're going to see this as it progresses, where, where charters have been given, and then charters are revoked, and then charters are rewritten, Okay, and 
this leads to consternation amongst the people who, one, founded it, who were the proprietors of these colonies, the ones who were actually setting it up to make the money, right? Um, and also it's affected by um, just the, the servants and the being a British subject and then having no elected assembly, right? So you had, as you see in the, in the later chapters, virtual representation. And how, did, how well did virtual representation work? It didn't? Why not? People realized that it was totally fake and they wanted to be represented. Ah, totally fake and wanted to be represented. Okay. As who they were, not by just someone told by the king to represent. Okay. All right. And actually, in that time period, right before the revolution, there was no one designated for the colonies. They were all, if you have the, the House of Lords, they're all land-owning lords in Europe, in England, right? And then you have the House of Commons, which is more of an elected assembly. So the House of Lords and the House of Commons form Parliament, and it's kind of like our Senate and House of Representatives, you know, the popular elected. But here, now, we have senators who are elected by vote, correct? All right, the lords are not elected by vote, they are appointed, um, and it's a lifetime appointment, okay? So you had the same thing set up here, where in, uh, in Virginia, you had the, the elected assembly killed, but then it was restored with the threat of the Civil War in the House of uh, Burgesses and the Governor's Council. The Governor's Council in Virginia was a lifetime appointment, okay? So a lot of similarities in the way that they were setting these colonies up and their, and their structure and their hierarchical structure, okay? And um, the county court here in Virginia was in charge of the local government. So they did a lot of, of that. Now, that's a difference than in some of the other colonies and in England. And then um, the Church of England, which was of what Protestant religion? Nope. Anglican. Anglican, thank you. Yes, the Church of England was the state religion. As a royal colony, you're going to have a state religion. And the state religion is Anglican, Church of England, which means that the Church of England is collecting all those taxes, right? Remember, in New England, who's collecting the taxes? Which church is collecting the taxes in England? In New England, excuse me. Right. And the Roman church, Catholic church. The Puritans, right, in New England. Um, and so you had to pay, if you were a citizen, you had to pay a church tax. And then so in some places, if you didn't go to church, you paid a tax. Okay? So you were fine if you didn't go to church. <laughs> so this is this is one of the reasons for church the separation of church and state. This is how one of those how it came about, right? Because you have these different scenarios between church and state, especially in the different uh, in the different areas. And then if you go to Maryland, which was a proprietary colony, started for as a uh, as an area for Catholics to have religious, to uh, be part of religious tolerance, okay? So, um, the colony was very wealthy, okay, but the, um, Lord Baltimore, who was Catholic, was free from royal taxation, okay? Which was pretty unusual, but it was uh, something that was set up, and then he set up a, a very hierarchical structure, okay? And then he had the power to appoint the, the sheriffs and the judges and create this local nobility. 
Now, creating a local mobility, you find, also happened in New York, right? New York, when they set it up, that's how they set up this, the structure, where they would have these landowners and these tenants would pay for use of the land, and that's how the landowners would become wealthy. That's how it was set up originally in Maryland, but it wasn't working that way. Okay? Because, for, for many reasons, because uh, they also, if you were an indentured servant in some areas, like in Virginia, when you were done, you were granted land. Okay? So it's different in all these different societies, but with Virginia and Maryland, uh, you ha need to remember that they were both in the, in the Chesapeake Society, Okay, and so the manners that Lord Baltimore created to create these um, these land owning areas where the tenants would pay, okay, uh, they were also set up so that the Catholics could have a chaplain on their land and it wouldn't be a problem, like it wouldn't be in the Protestant space, right? So there would be more religious tolerance there because they didn't have to go elsewhere to a church in order to uh, worship. They could worship on, on their land there. Okay, does that make sense? And this wasn't uncommon. Up to this point, a lot of uh, lords in Europe would have their own chaplain, whether that be Catholic or Anglican. And they would have their own chapel, their own chaplain, and they would support the the chaplain. And the chaplain would take care of the need, the spiritual needs of all of the serfs or the um, five, uh, the people and the fiefdoms, okay? And this is, this is going way back in history, but it's, it's not new, okay? Does that make sense? It's not a new, and it's not a completely new system. Okay, so uh, Maryland adapted the headright system of Virginia, which said, let me change this here, okay, that you could earn a 2,000 acre manor um, if you transported five adults into Maryland. Okay, that's a lot of land. Okay, but it costs a lot of money to transport five adults. So Virginia also did the same. They raised that in 1640 to 20 people. You had to bring in 20 people in order to be granted this 2,000 acres. But 2,000 acres is a lot of land, especially if you are not used to a lot of land, right? Um, and these people, these might, they might have been merchants, they might have been, uh, likely they were already landowners in Europe and England, um, but probably not to this extent. Okay? So there were, of course, religious tensions between the Catholics and the Protestants, even though it was set up um, for Catholics. There were more Protestants that lived in Maryland than the Catholics. Protestants were very suspicious of Catholics, um, and I imagine that Catholics were very suspicious of the Protestants, okay? Uh, you don't often hear both sides, but there's very, there are very few instances where it doesn't go back uh, both ways, all right? So there was an act of religious toleration that was passed in 1649 in the assembly uh, in Maryland. It had been enacted in 1642 by Lord Baltimore. One reason is so that he could bring more people into Maryland, okay? And then um, by 1654, Catholics were barred from voting and the Religious Toleration Act was repealed and the Catholics lost control in Maryland. So it was this, um, this tension that they were trying to avoid altogether that never really disappeared. Does that make sense? Okay, so death, gender, and kinship. Death is pretty, um, we talked a little bit about the, the death rates here. And so, 
um, indentured servants couldn't marry until they were done with their service. And so you didn't get a lot of, you didn't have a high birth rate because of that. And a lot of them died very, uh, very soon into their service, if they even finished their service. So the Chesapeake Society had a 20 year difference. They died 20 years earlier than people in New England did. Okay? Because of the typhoid and malaria. Um, so that just with the limited population growth, you have uh, a definite difference there. And then gender, you had fewer women coming in the Chesapeake Society than say in New England, because you might have families in New England and indentured servants, which were, the majority of indentured servants were male or female? Male, exactly, okay? All right, um, but in, upon death, a woman could potentially gain more than in most other regions of, um, of English, influence okay so they usually were left a hundred percent of this the um, I don't know I don't want to say spoils but if there was land or property they were left a hundred percent instead of one-third generally if you were a wife in England or in some of the other colonies you were only granted a third of the property upon your husband's death no matter what you brought into the to the marriage. Okay? Did you have a question? Generally they had children and it would go to the eldest son. Okay? And so um, the situation for wives especially was a little bit better um, in Chesapeake. You also had a little more negotiating power, I'd say, because there were more men than there were women. So you could be a bit more choosy. Okay, so you might find someone, you might come over as an indentured servant and find someone to buy out your indenture, your indentured contract and, and marry the person, right? And that, that person would likely, if they were able to buy out your service, they were likely a landowner, which meant that, hey, now you own land, or at least, you know, you were coming up in the world, right? Um, not that it was, not that it was an easy world in the Chesapeake, <laughs> but it was uh, stunted really until the late 17th century. The population increase, a lot of a lot of it was due to uh, the uh, the epidemics and the malaria and the yellow fever that that they had. Any questions? Okay, so tobacco in the Chesapeake was king, yes? Exactly. Okay, so, but because of tobacco, it took a lot of land, and so you had few neighbors. And you'll see this again, but when you have few neighbors, a lot of times your families feel isolated from others. And in isolation, you develop different uh, ways of doing things, okay? So if you had 25 square miles, you might have 24 families. Uh, most of them were isolated, but on the water, 80% were within half a mile of some sort of riverbank, okay? And why is that? Amanda, any ideas? No, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, most likely, or the reason that they were close to a riverbank is so that you could transport your tobacco, your product, right? Because tobacco was king at this time. It dominated uh, since 1618 when it boomed, but it sank by 1929. So the value... Um, decreased 
by 97 percent. All right, it's like a stock market crash, and uh, like the, the 1929 stock market crash, right? So you're making lots and lots of money, and then all of a sudden, the rug's completely pulled out from underneath you. You're making hardly any money. You're still making some, uh, but really, compared to what it was, it was uh, really tragic for the tobacco planters. It was still viable until about 1660. Okay, when in 1660 it was a penny a pound, which which really wasn't very profitable. wasn't profitable at all, actually. And then uh, you had debt. You had a lot of debt coming in and a lot of issues with debt in that in that way. Okay. Now the servants that were there for tobacco. The servants' uh, lives and situation were the worst except for the West Indies. Okay? There was a larger economic gap between servants and, and others in, than in New, New England. Okay? So New England had a, a smaller gap than they did in the Chesapeake. And they were, they were really impoverished. I mean, if you slept on rags on the ground, you were doing pretty well. Uh, it was really, really hard, okay, in the Chesapeake. And so two-thirds of the, of the Chesapeake servants were in Virginia. In Maryland, you could claim 50 acres of land, but not in Virginia, okay? And in order to claim the land, you had to survive that long. And like I said, some of them didn't. So in, in 1676, you had this, uh, this issue with, with indentured servants and slaves and wanting or needing land, okay? So you had these whites in Virginia who wanted land, but who owned the land? The yep, the natives owned a lot of the land, and the other land was owned by... Uh, very little land was owned by them. Yes? The very little was, yeah, very little was owned by them, but the, the landowners, you know, the, the wealthy landowners, okay, owned a good portion of the land, and they weren't selling the land. So if you wanted land, where'd you go? You went west, and the land out west was owned by the natives, right? Okay, so in uh, in Virginia, since the Third Powhatan War, Anglo-Powhatan War, from 1644 to 1646, there really hadn't been a lot of uh, a lot of issues between natives and the whites in Virginia. Okay. In 1653, a lot of the tribes were put on reservations. Sorry, I keep moving closer and closer. I don't mean to move out of the screen for you. Can you still see me? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, so 1653, the tribes were on these reservations, and and uh, they had agreed to stay within these boundaries. Okay, now the boundaries were written by whom? The English, the treaties, right? Okay, so if they were written by them, you had. Uh, whites who were actually squatting on the lands. So if you have people squatting on the lands, how does that go over with the natives? What do you think, Emmanuel? Natives are probably wondering why they're not doing anything productive with the land. Well, that could be, but also if they were squatting on, on their land, um, you know that that wasn't part of the agreement. Part of the agreement was that they were gonna that the natives would stay here, 
as long as the, the whites didn't bother. And now the whites were coming in and squatting on the land. Okay, so we get to the tension word. One of my former students told me that was one of my favorite words. <laughs> it's, it's a good word to use um, in response to this. So there were, um, Governor Berkeley was in Virginia at the time of Bacon's Rebellion. And so uh, he had fur traders and he wanted friendly natives because he was fur trading and who supplied the, the furs? The natives, right? Um, the freedmen really had very little. If you, again, if you had a pot and a shelter and some rags to sleep on on the ground, you were doing pretty well, right? Okay, and so if you see a difference in your situation, what often happens? If there's a huge gap in your situation, what happens? What do you mean a gap in your situation? Okay, um, you have white people who are free, who have next to nothing, and they're subsisting on roots. And you have natives who are um, engaged in a fur trade that's very lucrative, and they are um, preferred traders with the governor. Okay, so there's a gap there in how people are, one, being treated, and two, their, their economy, right, and how they're subsisting. So when you have that large of a gap, what happens? What, um, how do people react to that? Amanda, any ideas? Not a particularly good reaction. Okay. What might happen in, in that kind of a thing, situation? Star. Okay, go ahead, Star. I was just going to say maybe um, territorial boundaries and you know, wars and tension can happen because they all want, you know, they all have different things, so they would want to be either taking or trying to figure out how to get those things. Right. Exactly. Um, and so most people want to improve their situation, their economic situation, right? Um, and if you are seen, if you have a population that's seen as savage, and you are not savage, but yet you see their situation as being better in their terms, economically or socially, than yours, that's going to create a gap and that's going to create a situation where there is perceived inequities or very real inequities that create wars and tensions that could lead to wars, right? So um, in Virginia, that's exactly what happened. And so there was a, uh, in 1675, you had the, and I don't know how to pronounce it, the, da the Dag Indians, okay? And there were some whites killed, there were some Indians killed. But it created, it, would, it sparked um, a reaction amongst the people because the, the tensions were so high that it needed just a small spark, okay? And Bacon's Rebellion started, right? So Berkeley, who had been in, who was the uh, governor in Virginia, had built these forts and um, and Nathaniel Bacon was a small white farmer who had 300 colonists follow him in April of 1676 and they massacred a group of natives who were friendly natives okay they had um, there were there were no tensions at the time between the government and and those natives okay so by June of 1676 Berkeley granted Bacon leave to wage war on all Indians, okay? Because Berkeley um, was threatened by Bacon. Bacon came in and uh, and threatened him. 
So Berkeley said, okay, go ahead. And then Berkeley's like, I can't do that. So Berkeley went out and said, hey, you can't do that. So Bacon comes back and what's Bacon do? <laughs> Bacon burns Jamestown. Um, so you see where these tensions are? You see how there's this angst created by the, the inequity? Okay, is this uncommon in the world? Do you see some of this today, perhaps? Oil. Oil. Okay. Very good. Um, how about poverty in, in America? Have you seen anything in poverty in America that reminds you of this? Morgan, Taylor, any ideas? And this is a very loose association, but um, it does point to this gap in economy and uh, situation. No? How about the riots in the United States? The riots and the police shootings? Ferguson? Right, okay. So loosely, loosely associated, you might be able to tie these two together. And if you delved deeper into it, you could probably make more associations. But at the, at the very um, outside, you can see where there are some situations where things can get very emotional very quickly, right? Which a lot of revolutions are that way. But Bacon's Rebellion was uh, died in, uh, or dispersed in 1676, because after, after Bacon burned Jamestown and was about to, to create this, this issue, he died, just uh, of dysentery, like, right then. And so there were more peace talks. The Indians were granted uh, land in perpetuity. What does perpetuity mean? This is important. It was definitely a peace offering. In perpetuity means that they will always have it. It's perpetual. Okay, it will always be their land. Okay, it's always held in perpetuity. Okay, so um, the Bacon's Rebellion was significant not just because of of the the massacre or the the land in perpetuity. It represented this anger and uh, and racial hostility. Okay, again, like you are seeing here with Ferguson and, and some of the other areas, okay? You had marginal taxpayers, former servants, and wealthy planters all seeking land. Um, and if anybody was going to get the land, it was the wealthy at this point. So, um, from servitude, sir, any questions? Because they were not able to um, to better their their situation, okay. So they couldn't they couldn't make enough money to buy land. So they wanted land. They wanted to take land. So they were just squatting on it, okay. So they were building places to to live on other people's land, and most of that land was on the natives' land. And the natives said, "Wait a minute." Wait a minute, you can't do that. You already told us. We already moved once or twice or three times, and you gave us this land, and now you're encroaching. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Good question. Okay, so um, what the Chesapeake Society did in, in response to Bacon's Rebellion was another important uh, topic. And that is, they went from servitude to slavery because you had white servants who were represented as people, and you had slaves who were represented as non non people, right? 
They weren't considered people any longer. And so in order to keep the slaves and servants who sometimes worked together in rebellion, to keep them apart and also to make sure that um, they didn't have all these insurrections with the, with the whites, they moved slowly into more and more slaves for that reason and also with the, the malaria and, and the fact that, that so many uh, indentured servants died. Okay, does that make sense? So by 1700, 22% of the uh, inhabitants were slaves. 80% of the uh, unfree labor was replacing servitude. Okay. Also during this time, what began is uh, it was harder to get indentured servants because the economy in Britain was actually um, getting better. So people weren't as willing to come over as they had been. Make sense? Okay, so pattern of settlement in Surrey County, Virginia. This is a great map that displays you're not going to go more than half a mile from a river because you need to be able to get your tobacco to market. Right? I, I love the Otter Dam Swamp River. <laughs> okay, and here's a picture of uh, Chesapeake expansion. You can see how fast and how far it went between 1650 and 1700. Now imagine that. And you see the Tidewater region and you see the Piedmont region. and it's not so important in this during this um, first five chapters, but you're going to see here in the Tidewater and the Piedmont that it's uh, it becomes very important geographically um, in later in later times. Okay, so Puritanism in New England, building a city upon a hill. Okay, you had. Plymouth Plantation in 1620. You had the massive uh, Great Migration to New England in 1630. Um, by 1642, 21,000 people had arrived in New England. And the building a city upon a hill was all about building a city with uh, religious and social ideals in the Puritan way, right? It was all about the Puritans. New England way was all about the Puritans. Okay, so um, the Puritans came because they wanted to eliminate uh, the... Actually, uh, Charles I didn't tolerate Puritans, and he wanted to eliminate them within the Anglican Church, and so they were being persecuted. They decided to come here. Is there a question? Okay. All right. So you had... Somebody's mic is getting a lot of feedback. Oh, okay. All right. Um, you had the Massachusetts Bay Company, which sent 400 colonists to Salem, Massachusetts. Okay, self-governing colonists. You had um, 700 passengers in 1630 who came over into Boston with Governor George Winthrop. And he was the building a city upon a hill. All right, and it was a model of Christian charity. So Massachusetts and and Boston would be as the city upon the hill, and all and the eyes of all people are upon us. Okay, it was this great society. It was creating this great society. And one of the precepts of 
Puritanism is that they would subordinate personal interests to higher purposes. Okay, so you could only charge, if you were a merchant, you could only charge a certain amount of money for things. You couldn't overcharge. Um, and New England ways, they were basically ignoring the Anglican church's and bishop's authority, and their control was through the saints in their own churches, so they created these these churches and these saints, they named these saints within their churches. Um, and the clergy in New England quickly asserted a lot of power in New England, right? The clergy was very, very powerful. Any questions? Okay, and this is why education was important because it required literacy to remain and, and ensure orthodoxy. So if you were going to be a pure Puritan, which is one of their goals, you had to be able to know and read. Okay, That's why education, and that's why school boards were created. All right? So it, was, uh, it goes way back to the Puritans. You also had different universities that were founded um, in 1636, Harvard was founded to teach ministers, right? You still have the Harvard Divinity School, which you don't often hear about, but um, all of the major Columbia, Harvard, Princeton, um, there are multiple others, were all created for uh, to teach ministers of different faiths. And then you had Roger Williams, who was a separatist minister, who was advocating religious tolerance. Did not go over so well with Puritans, I have to say. They didn't, they didn't go for the religious, religious tolerance. Um, another reason the Lord Baltimore was not accepted very well. And so he was actually run out of Boston. You had Anne Hutchison in Boston, who criticized that uh, membership was, was done on good works because that was more like a Catholic doctrine. And, you know, Catholics are not part of the religious toleration and they're not Puritan for sure. And so they didn't all get along in, in New England. So Anne Hutchison was also exiled and she went to Providence, which became Rhode Island, where um, Roger Williams had gone. And her followers were called Antimonians, all right, because they were they were following her. They, um, however, because she bucked the system and spoke up, it led to greater um, restrictions on women's rights. She had led like Bible studies in her house, and uh, in the Puritan way, you were only supposed to uh, listen to the to the men on certain spiritual issues. Uh, she was extremely well read. If you read the, the excerpt in there, um, she ran circles around the, them at the trial, but she was, she was exiled because uh, she had talked about a direct like discussion with God or something. And so that also is not of the Puritan, of the Puritan way. So, uh, towns, families, and farm, li farm life. I know I'm going fast, but we have to cover this whole chapter. So, it's not as inclusive this time. Sorry. Or full of discussion. Um, your towns and your town meetings were significant because the, uh, the authority that the towns and the town meetings uh, represented, okay? In Sudbury, I had to read the information on Sudbury, and the meeting house is in the middle of town. There's a, there's a reason for that, because they wanted to make sure that everything revolved and, and it was kept cohesive and remained Puritan, okay? That it remained pure and Puritan, and they kept those ideals, those social and religious ideals, intact. Okay, and so 
by having small farm tracks, you can see the map here on the screen. By having the small farm tracks, you could you had more control because you um, would promote a godly order with the small farm tracks, and you wouldn't um, be overusing. And what evolved, however, is that the more children the people had, the more land they needed. And the more land they needed meaning meant they had to go out further. So you can see these outliers. And you can see some of the outliers here. This is why some of the towns, like Sudbury and Dan, uh, Danvers? Not Danvers. That's insane. Um, Sudbury and what? Wayland. Wayland. Okay? That's why those two towns uh, were created because people needed to move out and people needed more land to support themselves. Okay? All right. Women were still a, a social force in the towns, but their official, um, their official nature was very much restricted, especially because they no longer could or would talk about their conversion experience in the church. Only the men were to do that. Uh, the women could only do that now in front of their ministers. Okay, so it wasn't, it was no longer uh, public. And one thing about women in, even in New England, is that matrimony was a contract. It wasn't a religious sacrament. Okay, so divorce was permitted. Although there were very few divorces, there were divorces and the women had a great deal of um, influence on their husbands who were the judges and the magistrates because women couldn't hold those titles uh, but they were able to if someone was treating a, a woman badly and, the, and all the women knew about it he got his just due um, and so women were able to to divorce okay and one reason that they lived longer than in Chesapeake is also because they very rarely traveled out of their towns. And if you go, if you go to New England, who's been to New England or the East Coast? Spend any time back there? Okay. Yeah. So even today, people don't travel very much. Um, they stay within their own area. Okay. People didn't travel at this time hardly at all unless they were bringing in somebody to get married. Okay? Your sons uh, worked for the families for about at least 25 years. Okay? So you were always, by having the large families, you had this labor that would help support uh, you as you became elderly. And you'd be amazed at how elderly people actually were. I mean, now, uh, we saw graves of 80, 90 year olds when we were back there this summer. It was it was pretty phenomenal. You either died like in your 20s or earlier or your 80s or 90s. It was it was pretty interesting to see. Um, it, to, in my mind, I always think that that it was so hard that people died early. Well, they they lived a pretty long life. Okay, and then. Um, as opposed to the Chesapeake, women in New England got a third of the property, unless there were no heirs or it was stipulated in, in the will. Right? So another difference here. And this is Chipotle, but this is Anne Hutchinson's house site. Uh, so you can walk by it here in Boston if you go through Boston. It's pretty fun. And here's the map of, of Sudbury. Okay, so today Sudbury is what they used to call West Sudbury. Okay, um, today Wayland is where the original meeting house is, and you'll see you'll see pictures of that. But um, in 1643, there was a bridge that was built to the west, and so the town kept expanding. Okay, they went west and they went south. 1660 Marlborough plantation also became a, a separate town. And then um, by 1774, Sudbury was one of the largest towns outside of Boston. 
All right, there were about 400 militiamen in 1774. Sudbury was an important town in New England. All right, and on uh, April 19th of 1775, anybody know what happened then? Okay. Yes, Revolutionary War conquered, Lexington and Concord. Okay, um, 302 men from Sudbury went to Concord. All right, to fight. It it wasn't that far, but yes. How they get to How they get there? Because every single person was counted. Um, and there were 56 men buried in North Cemetery, which was the at the first town site. And you, you'll see photos here. Okay, This is one of the things that, that we do when we're on vacation is we go see things that we talk about. So this is... <laughs> okay, well, maybe it is the whole vacation, but it's not that bad, right? I mean, really. Okay, so Sudbury's town center today. You can see where they they have a, a site here, but the it's been taken over by a cemetery, and it was the the first meeting house and center of of the settlement. Okay, so right there, that triangle, that blue triangle, that's what you're looking at. Okay, and it's actually not as easy to see or find as you would think. Okay, um, so the meeting house. It, the the dates are really interesting because the information that I gave for you to read on Blackboard had some different dates than the information that Sudbury Town now has, have different dates than even the signage that you'll find. Okay? So it's uh, it's kind of hard even within the uh, the scholarship to determine the exact days and times that things happen. Right? But it was the third inland settlement after Concord and Dedham in Massachusetts. Right? And it was, of course, started as land grants and um, to individual and then to settlers who collectively. And Wayland, where, where we are today, here at the first town center, was uh, the first settlement in the Sudbury plantation. There were 60 men, women, and children. 15 of them were Puritan families. Okay, so you have, of course, the, the biographies that you read about Sudbury and you see the, the names. It's fascinating because you go to the, you go to the uh, cemeteries and all those names are there. And then you go to the next town over and all those names are there too. And you go to the next town over and all those names are there as well. Okay, so they kept expanding. Um, and marrying in because they they had a lot of children, right? All right. And generally, the first son was the only one to um, to actually get the land. All right. So here's your Revolutionary War Cemetery in Sudbury, and this is next to the common where the militia and the Minutemen actually. Um, gathered on April 19th of 1775. And then this this was a stone that I found. It was the first miss from Sudbury, England. John and Sarah came in 1638, right? Okay, you have Sudbury Pilgrim, Pilgrim descendants, Thomas and wife Abigail, son of John and Sarah. And then the next one on the other side. Okay, so um, 72 years old and 70 years old when they died. You have pilgrim descendants Amos and wife Susanna, son of Thomas and wife Abigail, son of John and Sarah. Right? These generations coming down. 87 and 76 they lived to. And then you have on the fourth side of the monument, 
pilgrim descendants Benjamin and Lucy, of Amos and Susanna, of Thomas and Abigail, and of John and Sarah. Right? They were 77 and 75 when they died. So, um, you know, you, you go to some of the cemeteries in Alaska and you might find a few of these, but you're not going to find whole families um, generally in, in the cemeteries, especially of this, uh, this, this old. Okay? And uh, here's the first parish meeting house. Okay, that's right in the center of the town of Sudbury. All right, it's now Universal uh, Unitarian Universalist. Okay, but it was built in 1797. So again, Sudbury, Sudbury is actually Wayland, and West Sudbury became Sudbury. Okay, it's kind of confusing, but um, this is. Here's, here's the church, or the meeting house. Here's the uh, Revolutionary War Cemetery I just showed you. Here's the commons. So it's all right here within a quarter mile. Not even a quarter mile. It's all, like, condensed. Okay? Unlike places in Alaska that spread out for five or ten miles, right? Okay, so economic and religious tensions with restoration. George Winthrop's vision was eroded um, because of the outliers and the outlivers. The, um, the Puritan vision of this closely knit society was changing. And change can equal tension. And tension equals change. And so your Puritanism in New England was changing. You had families who were not becoming saints because they didn't want to go through the, um, the grilling in church. Sometimes it took like a year to become a saint in, in the church. Um, people just didn't want to do it. And so the older the Puritans were, their sons and daughters weren't becoming members of the church, and then their grandchildren weren't becoming members of the church. So they bypassed the sons and daughters and created this way for the grandchildren to actually be baptized so they could become part of the church and keep the church going in the manner that they wanted. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah? All right, so uh, the restoration changed a lot because with Charles II, he undermined Puritan rule, especially in Massachusetts. And how did that happen? Who was Oliver Cromwell? Anybody know Valdez? Said. Who was Oliver Cromwell? Oliver Cromwell. Mm-hmm. I've heard the name before. I'm trying to do it without looking at my book. <laughs> you can look at your book. That's fine. Okay. All right. Yeah, so uh, Oliver Cromwell was a Puritan who was consolidating power during the Eng English Civil War in 1642. Okay? They overthrew the king. And um, he was a Puritan which wasn't as well received in England as they might have liked. And then the Restoration was with whom? 
Was it the restoration of the monarchy? Yes, it was the restoration of the monarchy. Okay, so you were um, dramatically changing uh, society um, with the restoration and that. Okay, so the next slide is shows you a, a map of the New England expansion. That is significant. Area of white settlement in 1674. Okay, look at that. And look at the islands of natives in amongst uh, the white settlements. Okay, there was little native resistance to start because 90% um, of the coastal Indians were wiped out in one epidemic. And the smallpox of 1633 to 34, and what happened is they would move west, they would move inland, but they would carry the disease with them unknowingly. And so they kept wiping out more and more people. Um, so by 16, um, by the mid-1630s, there were about 20,000 people. And so the few, um, the few dozen survivors at the time sold most of the land to the English. So... Um, in Massachusetts Bay, they prevented the religions of, um, of natives, and they wanted to convert them to Christianity, so they made praying villages. And the praying villages went well until there were some tensions. And then um, in Mystic, Connecticut, there was a the Pico War that the uh, Mohegan and the Narragansett were uh, fighting, and... The Picos were fighting. The Pico resistance were, was crushed by 1637 in, uh, in Mystic, Connecticut. And they've done, I was just reading here in the last six months, where they had an archaeological dig and they have found the tree um, where many of the, uh, of the Picos were massacred. I mean, it was, it was, a, uh, it was just a bloody massacre there in Mystic. So in 1600, approximately 125,000 natives. By 1675, approximately 10,000 natives. Okay. Um, and also, because they didn't know how to read, they would sign debt slips and then land would be taken from them. Okay, and this is one reason that you have uh, the BIA today and the land is still held in trust if it's a Bureau of Indian Affairs land. And so King Philip's War was the Wampanoag in Plymouth who were engulfed and uh, two-thirds of the colony's natives rallied behind uh, King Philip. And they burned 1,200 houses and killed 2,500 settlers. It was uh, the English with the Iroquois and the Mohawk, who joined up against them and crushed the, uh, the uprising. But it reduced the southern New England Indians by another 40% and eliminated organized resistance. Okay. And this is in Sudbury, and this was the, uh, the last town attacked during King Philip's War. And so this is a, a memorial to the to the colonists who were fighting against King Philip there, over 500 Indians attacked on April 21st of 1676. And then here's the memorial again. It was erected in 1852, but it says, uh, Captain Samuel Wadsworth of Milton, his Lieutenant Sharp of Brookline, Captain Brocklenbach of Raleigh, with about 26 other souls fighting for the defense of their country, were slain by the Indian enemy April 18, 1676, and lie buried in this place. Okay. So, a lot of different, again, a lot of different dates that you get. Was it the, uh, was it the 18th, or was it earlier, or later, I mean the 21st? All right, and then you then you get into 
witchcraft in Salem, and you talk about the vision of economy, and you talk about the difference between the haves and the have-nots. If you look at the accused versus the accuser, the accusers were generally lower status women and girls who were accusing women who had status and potentially had land. And um, some of them were married, some of them weren't, but they definitely had a, um, were in a better economic situation. Now, Salem was economically stagnant at the time. And two-thirds of the females were between the ages of 11 and 20. All right, There were uh, little girls who sent their uh, mothers to the gallows. Um, it was a really uh, amazing time. More than half of the women who lived in the town lost parents um, in Maine. They were orphans. Okay, So again, haves and have-nots. But also, um, new scholarship talks about what they were eating. They were eating a certain type of wheat, and the wheat had like a mold or something in it. And it created almost hallucinogen. Um, it acted almost like a hallucinogen. All right? So they perhaps did have see certain things, okay? Because they were claiming they would see things. And so um, generally Salem was a prosperous town port, and, um, but witchcraft was very prevalent in this time, very prevalent in Africa. And there was one woman who lived in Salem from the West Indies, a uh, West African Indian woman, and um, it created a, just a, a colony-wide panic with the uh, Salem witch trials. It was April of 1692. By, the, by late 1692, Massachusetts ministers would allow, um, or, or actually the, um, spectral evidence was allowed, and then by late 1692, they started objecting to the spectral evidence. Spectral evidence was just uh, what they said they saw, okay? Where a spirit resembling the accused had been seen tormenting the victim. Right? So there were um, some really crazy things, and when we went to Salem, there were stories of girls who said, well, what other fun is there in the town after being a after recanting an a, a accusation of claiming that one of their relatives was a witch. Um, so some of the girls were doing it for fun. Um, but 20 people were hanged and 50 people were um, confessed to being witches and they were saved. Because if you confessed, then you were okay. But if you said that you weren't a witch, you um, were hanged. So. Uh, there was really no winning in this situation. And so, um, by October, the governor forbade more imprisonments for witchcraft. One reason is because his wife was accused of being a witch. Um, and so, he finally said, ah, we're going we're gonna to stop this. Okay, But it ended Puritan New England. All right, so what I want you to do is go through the rest of your slides. Okay, I have a lot of um, a lot of different slides in here. We're about halfway through. We'll hit some highlights of it next week or Thursday. What day is today? Tuesday. We'll have more highlights of it uh, on Thursday, and then we'll do chapter four on Thursday. And what else? Any questions? Turn in yeah. your information on your paper. Exercise, the 50 questions. Yes. Is that for us? Do we have to do that as well? It is due after you do the Constitution Day. Yes, it is due, so you can work on it now if you want, but it's due after your Constitution Day. Okay, yes. How do you want us to format that? Do you want us to just like number? 
however you want to do it. Don't renumber it. Well, I've just been typing in that. And that's fine. The odd point. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. okay. Any other questions? The quiz you need to turn in. Okay.